Hello programmers, this is part two of the discussion that covers encapsulation as used by C++ classes and objects. If you have not already seen it yet, I recommend watching part one first, which provides an introduction to objects and classes. Parts three and four are in separate discussions and cover inheritance and polymorphism. If you are watching this as a video, links to the other parts of the discussion should be available in the comments section on YouTube. Why do we use encapsulation? Instead of using a bank, every person could put all their money in piles on a table and only take what belongs to their own pile. Hopefully, nobody takes my money either on purpose or by accident or somehow the piles get mixed in with each other it is much better to provide controlled access. By providing public access, a program that uses the class book one has unregulated ability to read or modify any of the data members. By encapsulating the data within a class definition, we can restrict access to the data by marking it private and providing access only through public methods that can either get or modify the data for us, similar to working with a bank teller to get or deposit our money. If I were to develop a weekly payroll program, I could define a class for a timesheet that contained variables for hours worked and pay rate. Instead of making these variables public, I can make them private and provide public access methods to either set or get the data. Methods that place data into the private variables are commonly referred to as setters or mutators. Methods that retrieve data from private variables are referred to as getters or accessors. Methods that put data into an object's private member data variables could also contain code that validates the data before storing it into an object. For example, if the class definition is for weekly hour paycheck, the hours worked could be validated to make sure that it is not negative or over 168, which are the total number of hours in a week. Here is a definition of encapsulation from Wikipedia. Encapsulation is one of the fundamentals of OOP, Object Oriented Programming. It refers to the building of data with the methods that operate on that data. Encapsulation is used to hide the values or state of a structured data object inside a class, preventing unauthorized parties from direct access to them. Publicly accessible methods are generally provided in the class, so-called getters and setters, to access the values. Other client classes can call these methods to retrieve and modify the values within the object. Since I am adding more features to the Book 1.h class definition that was discussed in Part 1, I am going to name the updated version Book 2.h so that I won't get confused. I'm also going to create a separate C++ project and name it Book 2 Test. Before developing the new version of Class Book, I want to review just a few things about the old version. Everything in the class had public access. The code for both constructors was in the class definition. When I update the project to version 2, I will divide the code for the Book 2 class into two different files. The header file, Book2.h, contains the class definition with the member data, but only contains function prototypes for the member function methods, but no code. The executable code for class Book2 is placed in a separate file named Book2.cpp. When these parts of the class definition are separated into two separate files, the Book2.h file with the class definition is called the interface, and the Book2.cpp file that has the executable code is called the implementation. These are the two OOP terms that are nice to remember. I realize that this seems like a lot of extra work for a small program that has been created so far, but this way of doing things is really important as projects get larger. The main program includes Book2.h and does not need to know how the executable code for the book object works when it declares a book object. Suppose you rent a car. 
As a driver, you are already familiar with the interface controls between you and the car, such as steering wheel, accelerator, and brakes. You don't need to know whether the engine has a carburetor or fuel injection, or whether it has disc or drum brakes. You just need to be able to drive the car without worrying about how the mechanical parts are implemented. Before discussing encapsulation as part of the class definition for version 2 of the project, I want to show what the book2.h and book2.cpp files start to look like. The class is defined in book2.h, and the data members now have private access. The constructors are declared using the public access specifier. This means that when an object is instantiated in the main program file, main will be able to access the public constructors, but it won't be able to access the private data. We can fix that in a little bit. Let's look at the book2.cpp and how it implements the constructors. At the top of the file, pound include quote book2.h quote brings in the header file when book2.cpp is compiled. We will also need to use pound include book2.h in the main program to give it access to the book2 class interface definition. The code for the default constructor is written as book2 colon colon book2 open parentheses close parentheses. The double colon characters are called the scope resolution operator. We need to put book2 colon colon in front of any constructor or method whose code is not actually in the file where class book2 is actually defined. After book2 colon colon is book2 open close parentheses, which is the name of the default constructor. This is how the code and the two files are linked together. The for argument constructor is done in a similar manner. It is coded as book2 colon colon book2 open parentheses string t comma string a comma double p comma int i close parentheses. Because the member data title, author, price, and in stock have private access, they can no longer be accessed directly by main or any other part of the program that refers to the objects instantiated by the Book2 class definition. We need some way for the parts of the program that create Book2 classes to access those data members. Setters and getters to the rescue! Although I'm using the common terms for these access methods, some textbooks call them mutators and accessors instead of setters and getters. They still do the same thing, even if they're called something different. Although any part of a program could instantiate a book to object, I'm doing it in main for this example. For the purposes of the discussion, when I refer to main instantiating an object, it could be done anywhere. For each class's data members that I want to make available to main, I will provide a setter method for main to place data in the private variable and a getter method to retrieve the data. In these code segments, main is instantiating a book to object named my book. Then it uses my book dot set title open parentheses quote dream job quote close parentheses semicolon to place dream job into the title member data variable that is part of the object. Book2.h is the interface between the main program and the code in Book2.cpp that actually does the work. Inside the class definition is the private data member title and the public setter method named setTitle, but there is no executable code for the setTitle method. The Book2.h file only has a function prototype for setTitle. Book2.cpp contains the implementation code for the set title method. Inside the parentheses is string t. The argument t is a variable of type string that is going to retrieve the string dream job that is passed when main calls my book.set title open parentheses quote dream job quote close parentheses semicolon. I named the argument variable T, but you could even give it any legal name you wish. The first line in the method is title equal T, semicolon, which copies the string dream job, 
which is in the variable t, into the private member data variable named title. Looking back at the definition for the method, it shows that the return data type is string. Therefore, we need to use a return statement in book2.cpp to return a string. I am returning the same data that set title received. In this case, it is dream job. I'm only doing this so that the set title method can possibly be used at some time later as part of a bigger expression. One last piece of information is that the pound include quote book 2.h quote statement needs to be placed at the top of both the main program and book 2.cpp. The method set title gives us the ability to place a string in the book 2 member data named title. Since title has private access, we need a getter method to let main retrieve whatever is in the title. Book2.h now has a function prototype for getTitle with a return data type of string. The code implemented in Book2.cpp is placed all in one line in this example. String is the return data type. Book2 colon colon identifies that this code belongs to the class Book2. GetTitle is the name of the function method. I know it is a function because it has the parentheses after the function's name. The open and close curly braces identify the block of code that belongs to the function method and return title semicolon is the only line of code in the body of the function. Return title semicolon gets the contents of the private member data named title and sends it back to the main program. The const keyword is applied to the getter methods. By identifying a method with const, this would cause a compiler error if the method tried to modify any data. Although the getter methods in this project can't modify any of the object's member data, const is provided here for good programming practice to prevent future problems if the method was updated later. Some companies may want you to code this function method on multiple lines instead of one line. If you decide to co if you decide to code the function method using only one line, pay close attention to the placement of the curly braces and especially the semicolon. The semicolon ends the return statement and is placed inside the block of code, not after the closed curly brace at the end of the line. The setters and getters for the rest of Book 2 class member data will be coded similar to how set title open close parentheses and get title open close parentheses were coded. One of the differences will be the data types of the variables, but I am going to add some extra code when working with the price and in stock member variables. I don't want the setter methods for these variables to accept negative values. The code in the set price checks to see if the value it received is less than 0.0. .0. If it is, then the price member variable is set to 0.00. .00. Else, the price member variable is set to the value that was priced to the set price member method by main. The return statement sends back the value that was actually stored in the price member variable. The conditional operator is used in the set in stock to do the same thing. The conditional operator was described way in the beginning of the course and hasn't seen much use. I want to review it here since it's cool and you may see it used by other programmers and no longer wonder what it means. The test condition checks to see if less than zero. If the value after the question mark is used, then the assignment operator equals places a zero into the object's in stock member variable. If the condition i less than zero is false, then a positive number was passed to the in stock method. When the conditional operator test is false, the value after the colon is used and the assignment operator places the value received from main in the argument named i into the object's in stock member variable. Return in stock semicolon sends back the value that was actually stored in the in stock member variable. Let's go back and look at the constructors and the setter for in stock. Second book used the default constructor and the setter for in stock. This worked fine. 
the default constructor initialized member data to empty strings and zeros, and then setters were called to put good data into second book's member data. The set in stock open parentheses int i close parentheses method correctly set in stock member data to a zero when it received a negative number. However, the mybook object used the for argument constructor, which just copied each value from the argument list into the mybook member variables without checking for negative values. Although we could duplicate code that checks for negative numbers from the setters into the constructor, there is a better way have the for argument constructor call the setters instead of blindly copying data from the argument list into the member variables. Now, it doesn't matter whether the for argument constructor is used or if the setters are used after the object is instantiated. This is the end of the C++ OOP discussion that covers encapsulation. Check out the next discussion. Part 3 covers inheritance.